Classic Detective Stories. Copyright Black Cat Publishing. The Five Orange Pips by Arthur Conan Doyle Part 1 I have a complete record of all Sherlock Holmes's cases between 1880 and 1897. My friend and I worked together on some very important crimes during that period. We also worked on some very strange cases together. The strangest of all the cases is the one I am going to write about now. It all began in September. The weather was terrible, I remember. It rained and it was very windy all day. The weather grew worse in the evening. Sherlock Holmes and I sat by the fire in his flat in Baker Street. We did not say much. Holmes was working with some papers, and I was reading a story. Suddenly, I heard the bell. I wonder who that is, I said. Are you expecting a friend, Holmes? No, he said quietly. You're my only friend, Watson. I don't like people visiting me at home. Then it must be a client, I suggested. If it is a client, Holmes replied gravely, it is a serious case. No one would walk through this storm if the case were not serious. The landlady opened the front door of the house. A few moments later, there was a knock on the door of Holmes's flat. Come in, cried Holmes. A young man entered the room. He looked about twenty-two years old, and he was well-dressed. He seemed very nervous and he was pale. Give me your coat and umbrella, Holmes ordered. I will hang them up to dry. I see you have come to London from the southwest, he added. Yes, the young man agreed. He looked surprised. I've just come from Horsham. But how did you know that? The clay and chalk on your shoes is very distinctive, Holmes told him. I've come for advice, said the young man. Advice is easy to give, Holmes replied. I need help as well as advice, the young man added. Help is not always easy to give, Holmes said seriously. I've heard a lot about you, Mr Holmes, the young man said. Major Prendergast told me how you helped him in the Tankerville Club scandal. Ah, yes, Holmes remembered with a smile. The Major was accused of cheating at cards. He said you could solve any mystery, the young man cried. That was an exaggeration, Holmes said quietly. The Major said you are always successful. That's not true, Holmes corrected him. I have lost four times, three times against men and once against a woman. But you've had hundreds of cases, the young man went on. Four defeats are nothing against hundreds of successes. I'm sure you'll be successful with my case. Please tell us all about it, my friend suggested. It's a strange case, the young man began. The things that have happened in my family are very mysterious. Tell us everything, Holmes repeated. My name is John Openshaw, the young man said. I have very little to do with the story. To understand it, you will have to know something about the history of my family. He paused for a moment. Then he went on. My grandfather had two sons, my uncle Elias and my father, Joseph. My father had a bicycle factory in Coventry. He was very successful, and when he retired, he was a rich man. My uncle Elias went to America when he was a young man. He, too, became a successful man. He owned property in Florida. He fought for the South in the American Civil War. He became a colonel in the Confederate Army. He did not want black people in America to have the vote. 
when the South was defeated, my uncle Elias returned to his property in Florida. He came back to England some years ago. He bought a house in Horsham. He was an odd man. He was not very friendly, and he lived by himself. His neighbours sometimes saw him in his garden, but he generally stayed in the house. He drank a lot of brandy, and he never had any visitors. He did not want to see his brother. He seemed fond of me, however. Mr. Openshaw continued. He asked my father if I could live with him. I first went to his house when I was about twelve years old. He was kind in his own way. He played draughts with me, and he put me in charge of the servants in the house. By the time I was sixteen, I was master of the house. I had all the keys of the house, and I could do what I wanted. There was only one place I couldn't go into, Mr. Openshaw said. There was a room in the attic that my uncle kept locked all the time. He did not allow anyone to go in there. I looked through the keyhole of that room when I was a boy, but it wasn't very interesting. I could only see pieces of old luggage and boxes of papers. One day, my uncle received a letter. He looked carefully at the foreign stamp on the envelope. From India, I wonder what it can be, he muttered. He opened the letter quickly. Five orange pips fell out of it onto the table. My uncle went very pale. He looked terrified. He stared at the envelope. K K K! He cried loudly. He looked at the postmark on the envelope. From Pondicherry, he said. What's the matter, Uncle? I cried. Death. He said, "That's what this letter means. I have done bad things in the past, and now I'm going to die." He got up from the table and went into his room. He was still very pale. I picked up the envelope and saw the letters K K K written on the inside of the flap. There was no letter inside it, just the five orange pips. I couldn't understand what was happening. I left the dining room a few minutes later and went upstairs. I saw my uncle coming down the stairs. He was carrying a key in one hand and a box in the other. He had been into the locked room in the attic. They can try if they want, he muttered mysteriously, but I'll beat them in the end. Then he spoke to me. Call Mister Fordham, my lawyer," he ordered. That afternoon, the lawyer arrived. My uncle called me into the room. There was a fire burning in the room. There were lots of papers burning in the fire. The box from the attic room was open on the table. I saw the letters K K K on the inside of the lid. I'm making a will. Uncle Elias told me, "I'm leaving everything to your father. When he dies, you will have it all, John. Enjoy it if you can." He told me. Then he said a very odd thing. But if you can't enjoy it, give everything to your worst enemy. My uncle changed after that day. He began to drink a lot more. He spent most of the time in his room. Once or twice, he came out of the room carrying a revolver. He sometimes rushed into the garden, crying that he was not afraid of anyone. One day, he rushed into the garden with his revolver. This time, he did not come back. We found him lying at the edge of a pond in the garden. His head was in the water. He was dead. There was an investigation, of course. The coroner decided that Uncle Elias had committed suicide. My father 
inherited the property. Part 2 One moment, said Holmes eagerly. This is a very interesting story. I want to be sure of the facts. When did your uncle receive the letter with the five orange pips? The letter arrived on the 10th of March, 1883, Mr Openshaw answered. And when did he die? Holmes asked him. He died seven weeks later, on the 2nd of May, Mr Openshaw replied. I see, Holmes said quietly. Now, please go on with the story. Tell us what happened next. My father examined the property very carefully, Mr Openshaw said. He searched the room in the attic. The box was there. A label on the inside of the box had the letters KKK written on it. There was a note on the label which said, Letters, Papers, Receipts. The box was empty, but my father found some other papers in the attic. These were records of my uncle's military career. Other papers came from the period after the Civil War. They showed that my uncle did not like the new political situation in America. He did not like the new freedom that black people had. He did not like the new politicians from the North who came to Florida. My father came to live in the house in Horsham at the beginning of 1884. Everything went well for about a year. Then, one morning at breakfast, he suddenly gave a cry of surprise. I looked up and he was sitting with an envelope in one hand. In his other hand, he was holding five orange pips. Of course, he knew the story of the five orange pips, but he had always laughed at it. Now he looked worried. What does this mean, John? he asked me. His voice sounded scared. It's KKK, I replied. He looked inside the envelope. You're right, he said. But what about this? he asked anxiously. What does this mean? He showed me the envelope. Above the letters KKK, there was some writing. Put the papers on the sundial in the garden, I read. What papers? I don't understand any of this. The papers must be the ones from the attic, I told him. Uncle Elias destroyed them all before he died. My father was worried, but he was determined to fight his fear. This is all nonsense, he decided. Where does this letter come from? I looked at the postmark on the outside of the envelope. Dundee, I told him. The letter was posted in Dundee. We were silent for a moment. I think you should tell the police, I warned my father. They'd laugh at me, he said quickly. This is just a foolish joke, John. We'll say no more about it. I tried to persuade my father to do something about the letter and the five orange pips. It was no good. He refused to do anything. About three days later, he went to stay with an old friend of his, Major Freebody. I was glad my father was away from the house. I thought he was out of danger, but I was wrong. The Major sent me a telegram two days after my father's arrival. Something terrible had happened. My father had fallen over the edge of a chalk pit while he was out walking one evening. He died a few days later. I investigated the accident very carefully, Mr. Holmes. There was no evidence of murder. The coroner decided that my father had died as a result of an accident. 
That is the story of my family, Mr. Openshaw said. That is how I became the owner of my uncle's house about three years ago. I have lived there very happily, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Openshaw stopped talking for a moment. He put his hand in his pocket and took out an envelope. Until yesterday morning, that is, he said slowly. He emptied the contents of the envelope onto the table in front of him. Five orange pips rolled out of it. The envelope was posted in London, Mr. Openshaw told us. There was the same message that my father received. K, K, K. Put the papers on the sundial. What have you done about it? Holmes wanted to know. Nothing, the young man replied. Nothing? Holmes repeated in surprise. What could I do? Mr. Openshaw asked him. I feel desperate, like an animal in a trap. You must act. Holmes announced, "You must save yourself." I went to the police, Mr. Openshaw said. It was no good. They listened to my story, but they didn't believe me. They just sent a policeman to the house. He added, "Why did you come to me?" Holmes wanted to know. And why didn't you come sooner? I only spoke to Major Prendergast today. The young man said. Holmes began to speak quickly. You received the letter yesterday, he said. Do you have any other evidence to show me? Only this, Mr. Openshaw told him. He put a piece of blue paper on the table. I found this piece of paper in my uncle's room, after he burnt the papers from the box. He explained. It was on the floor. It seems to be a page from a diary. Holmes and I looked at the piece of paper. It was dated March eighteen sixty nine, and beneath it was written. Fourth, Hudson came, same old platform. Seventh, sent the pips to Macaulay, Paramore. And John Swain of Saint Augustine. Ninth, Macaulay cleared. Tenth, John Swain cleared. Twelfth, visited Paramore. All well. Holmes studied the piece of paper for a few minutes, and then he turned to Mister Openshaw. You must go home at once. He ordered him, "Put this piece of paper into the box from the room in the attic. Then put the box on the sundial in the garden. You must also write a note. Explain that your uncle burnt all the other papers. You can do nothing else at the moment. Do you understand?" "Yes, I do," Mister Openshaw said. I'll do what you advise, Mister Holmes. Go home straight away, Holmes told him, and be very careful. You are in great danger. I'm carrying a revolver, Mister Openshaw replied. Good, Holmes replied. I will begin working on the case tomorrow. You'll come to the house in Horsham then, Mister Openshaw asked him. No, Holmes said. The secret of the case is here in London. I shall stay here to solve the mystery. Part three. Mister Openshaw left the flat a little while later. Holmes and I sat in silence for a while. Then he lit his pipe and smoked for a few minutes. This is a strange case, Watson," he said at last. "John Openshaw is in very great danger, very great danger indeed." "What kind of danger, Holmes?" I asked excitedly. Holmes did not reply to my question. 
Pass me the American Encyclopedia, he said. I think we shall find out something useful if we study the volume for the letter K, he told me. We also have to think about Colonel Openshaw, he said. Why did he leave America, I wonder? Was he frightened of something? And why did he lead such a solitary life when he arrived here in England? Was he still afraid of something? He paused for a moment. What do the envelopes tell us? He asked me. Where were the letters sent from, Watson? They were sent from Pondicherry, Dundee and London, I said. The last one came from East London, he said. What does that information tell you, Watson? They are all seaports. I cried excitedly. The writer was on a ship. Precisely, agreed Holmes. Now think about this. Colonel Openshaw died seven weeks after he received the orange pips. His brother died only a few days after he received the pips. How do you explain that, Watson? I can't, I admitted. What does it mean, Holmes? The writer sends each letter on the mail boat, Holmes said. He then takes another boat to come to England. There is always a delay between the arrival of the letter and the death. The reason for the delay is clear. The mail boat is a fast steam vessel. The writer of the letters travels on a slower boat, a sailing ship. But why, Holmes? I asked. What is the reason for these murders? Colonel Openshaw's papers were very important to the writer of these letters, Holmes said. I think there is more than one man, Watson. There have been two murders. That suggests an organization. KKK are not the initials of an individual. They are the sign of an organization, you see. The organization wants Colonel Openshaw's papers, and they will kill to get them. What organization, Holmes? Holmes turned the pages of the American Encyclopedia. The Ku Klux Klan, Watson. It's a secret organization that came into existence after the American Civil War. It had centers in Tennessee, Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. Colonel Openshaw lived in Florida, you remember. The purpose of the Ku Klux Klan was terrible. They were against giving black Americans the right to vote. They were very dangerous. They also had a strange tradition, Watson. If they wanted to kill a man, they sent him a warning first. They used oak leaves, melon seeds, or orange pips as the warning. The victim then had a chance to change his ways or to leave the country. The Ku Klux Klan collapsed in 1869. Holmes looked at me closely. Openshaw came to England in 1869. He reminded me. I think he was carrying the Ku Klux Klan's papers. That may be the reason for the organization's sudden collapse. His diary contains details about the organization's members. They are not safe until they have the diary back. What about the page from the diary? I asked. What does that mean? It's pretty clear what it means, Holmes said. Sent the pips to Macaulay, Paramore, and John Swain of St. Augustine. That's the warning, you see. The next entry says Macaulay cleared. That means he ran away. Then there's the final entry, visited Paramore. I expect the visit 
was a fatal one. The next morning, Holmes and I had breakfast together at his flat. I'm worried about Mr. Openshaw, he told me. I may go to Horsham after all. As he spoke, I picked up the newspaper that was lying on the table. I saw the headline immediately. Holmes, I cried, you're too late. What do you mean? Holmes asked quickly. I passed him the morning newspaper. Tragedy near Waterloo Bridge Police Constable Hook was on duty yesterday evening near Waterloo Bridge. He heard a cry for help and then a splash in the water. It was a very dark night and the weather was bad. The constable could not rescue the man. The water police found the body of a young man in the river. The man was John Openshaw of Horsham. Police believe that he was hurrying through the dark streets and fell into the river by accident. There was no sign of violence on the body. Holmes put the newspaper down. I have never seen him look so angry. I'll get them, Watson. I'll find the men who did this, my friend said. Openshaw came to me for help. Now he's dead. He thought for a moment, and then he made a decision. I'm going out, he announced. To the police, I asked him. Are you going to talk to them? Not yet, Watson. Not until I've solved the mystery. I did not see my friend for the rest of the day. I returned to the flat in Baker Street early that evening. Holmes was not there, so I waited for him. He came in at about ten o'clock. He was pale, and he looked very tired. He ate a piece of bread hungrily and took a long drink of water. You're hungry, I commented. I haven't eaten since this morning, he told me. I've been very busy all day. He faced me excitedly. I've got them, Watson. I've got them, he cried. I know who they are now, and I know what I'm going to do. He took an orange from the table and began to pawn the pips out of it. He put five pips into an envelope and wrote a name and address on it. Captain James Calhoun, Bark, Lone Star, Savannah, Georgia. That message will be waiting for him when he arrives, Holmes said with a smile. But who is he? Who is this Captain Calhoun? I asked. He's the leader of the organization, Holmes told me. How did you find out about him? I asked. Holmes smiled at me. I spent the day studying old newspapers, he informed me. I made a list of all the sailing ships that stopped at Pondicherry in January and February 1883. There were 36 of them. One of them was called the Lone Star. The name gave me a connection with America, you see. Texas is sometimes called the Lone Star State, I confirmed. Then what did you do, Holmes? I made a list of all the sailing ships that stopped in Dundee in January 1885, Holmes said. Again, the Lone Star was one of them. Then I discovered that the Lone Star arrived in London a week ago. She has left London now and is returning to Savannah. What are you going to do? That's easy, Holmes replied. Only three members of the crew are Americans, Captain Calhoun and two others. I also know that the three Americans left the ship last night. I spoke to one of the sailors on the boat, you see. The mail boat is faster than the Lone Star. My letter will be waiting for these three men when they arrive. And so will the American police, he concluded. Holmes was wrong, however. 
The murderers of John Openshaw never received the five orange pips that he sent them. The police never arrested them either. The weather that year was very bad, and there was a great storm in the Atlantic Ocean. The lone star was caught in the storm, and she sank without survivors. Hunted Down by Charles Dickens Part 1 Most people have a chance to see exciting events in their lives. I am the chief manager of an insurance office. I, too, have seen exciting things in my thirty years of work. My office had one wall that was covered in glass. I could see everybody who came into the insurance company. I liked to study the faces of new customers before I spoke to them. I decided what kind of people they were before they said a word to me. I learned to trust my first impression of people. The story I want to tell is about a man who came into the company one day. I watched him through the glass in my office. He seemed about forty years old, and he was very well dressed. He seemed very polite, and he appeared to be quite a gentleman. He was talking to one of the clerks. Despite his appearance, I disliked this man as soon as I saw him. Suddenly, the man noticed that I was looking at him. He smiled at me through the glass. Then he took some papers from the clerk and left. A few minutes later, I called the clerk into my office. Who was that man? I asked him. That was Mr. Julius Slinkton, sir, the clerk told me. He's from the Middle Temple. What did he want? I inquired. He wanted one of our insurance forms, the clerk replied. He said that a friend of yours recommended this company. He knew my name then, did he? Oh, yes, Mr. Sampson, the clerk confirmed. He knew your name. About two weeks later, I went to have dinner with a friend of mine. One of the other guests was Mr. Julius Slinkton. He was standing near the fire. He noticed me, and he asked our host to introduce him to me. Our host quickly brought him over. The three of us began to talk. I thought you knew Mr. Sampson already, our host said. No, Mr. Slinkton told him. I followed your advice. I went into the insurance office, but I didn't speak to Mr. Sampson. I didn't want to disturb him. Did you come to the office to take out an insurance policy? I asked Mr. Slinkton politely. Was it a life insurance policy? It's not a policy for me, Mr. Slinkton said. It's for a friend of mine. He asked me to get the information for him. I don't know whether he will take out the policy. People often change their minds, don't you think, Mr. Sampson? Yes, I replied. We began to talk about other things. Your profession has suffered a great loss, Mr. Slinkton said suddenly. I did not know what he was talking about. A loss? I asked in surprise. 
What kind of loss, sir? A financial one? Mr. Slinkton laughed. <laughs> I don't mean a financial loss, he explained. I was referring to Mr. Meltham. Now I understood what he was talking about. Ah, yes, Mr. Meltham, I agreed. That was indeed a sad loss. He was the most brilliant man I have ever known in the insurance profession. But did you know Mr. Meltham? I asked. I knew his reputation, Mr. Slinkton told me. What a sad story it is. A young man like that suddenly gives up his business and retires from the world. I have said that I disliked Mr. Slinkton when I first saw him in the insurance office. I still disliked him. I did not think he was really sad about Mr. Meltham at all. I decided to ask Mr. Slinkton some questions. I wanted to find out more about this man. Have you heard why Mr. Meltham left his business? I asked. I have only heard stories about it, he said. Apparently, Mr. Meltham was unhappy in love. That's not the truth. I told him. The truth is that the lady died. She died, did she? Mr. Slinkton repeated. That's terrible. Poor Mr. Meltham. How very sad for him. I still felt that Mr. Slinkton was not sincere. There was something false about his expression of sadness. Then he said to me, "You are surprised that Mr. Meltham's story affects me so strongly. I can see that, Mr. Sampson. But I too have suffered a terrible loss recently. I have two nieces, you see. One of them, a girl of twenty-three, died recently. The other niece." Is also not well. The world is a very sad place. Now, I thought I understood Mr. Slinkton. He was a sensitive man who had suffered. I was angry with myself for disliking him. I watched him for the rest of the evening, and he seemed to be a good man. He talked politely to everybody, and everybody seemed to like him. I decided that my first impression of Mr. Slinkton was wrong. I spoke to our host about Mr. Slinkton. He told me that he had not known him for very long. He told me that Mr. Slinkton. Had taken his two nieces to Italy for their health. It was there that one of them had died. He had returned to England afterwards with his other niece. Now, I felt that I understood Mr. Slinkton. I was deeply ashamed of my previous distrust of him. Part two. Two days later, I was sitting in my office as usual. I saw Mr. Slinkton come into the outer office. As soon as I saw him, I disliked him again. Mr. Slinkton waved cheerfully at me, and came into my office. I have come back. He said, "Because I want to find out what my friend has done with the insurance forms."
I want to know whether he has sent them back to the company. His family are worried about him, you see. They want him to buy a good insurance policy. Perhaps I can help, I said. What is your friend's name, Mr. Slinkton? I asked him. Beckwith, he told me. I called the clerk into my office. I asked him to find out if a man called Beckwith had started an insurance policy with the company. The clerk searched through his files for a moment, and then he brought me some papers. Yes, Mr. Sampson, he said. We received these forms from Mr. Beckwith. He wants a policy for two thousand pounds, and he has asked Mr. Slinkton to write a reference for him. Me? Cried Mr. Slinkton in surprise. He thought for a moment. But of course I can do that for him. Mr. Slinkton sat down in my office and wrote the reference for Mr. Beckwith. He left the forms in my office, said goodbye politely, and then left. Mr. Slinkton. Was not my only visitor that day. Very early that morning, someone else had come to see me at my house. The visit was a very private one. No one knew anything about it at all. Mister Beckwith's insurance policy began in March. I did not see Mr. Slinkton again for six or seven months. I went to Scarborough in September, and I saw Mr. Slinkton walking on the beach there. It was early evening, and he greeted me warmly. Mr. Slinkton was with a young lady. He introduced me to her, explaining. That she was his niece. Her name was Miss Niner. I looked at her carefully. I was sorry to see that Miss Niner did not look very well at all. As we walked along the sand, Mister Slinkton pointed to some tracks in the sand. He laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! Your shadow has been here again," he joked to Miss Niner. "Shadow? What shadow?" I asked. "My uncle is joking, Mister Sampson," she explained. "There is an elderly gentleman here in Scarborough. He travels around in a hand carriage." I see him so often that my uncle calls him my shadow. As she was speaking, we saw the old man's hand carriage come into sight. There was a frail old man inside. As the carriage was passing us, he waved his arm at me. He called to me by name. I went to see what he wanted. I was away from Mr. Slinkton and Miss Niner for about five minutes. My niece is very curious, Mr. Slinkton told me, when I rejoined them. She wants to know who her shadow is. His name's Major Banks, I told him. He's a very rich man, but a very sick one. He's just been telling me what pleasure you both give him. He says it's obvious that you are very fond of one another. It's true, we are very close, 
Mr. Slinkton said very seriously. We are alone, you know, since Margaret died. Miss Nina looked sad at her uncle's words. The memory of her sister was clearly still very painful to her. Suddenly, she sat down near a rock on the beach. She was pale. Mr. Slinkton walked away from us. He, too, seemed very upset by his memories. Miss Nina began to tell me about her uncle. She said he was a very good, kind man. She told me that she knew she was going to die soon. She was worried about what would happen to her uncle when she died. I saw the hand carriage coming back towards us along the sand as she was talking. Suddenly I interrupted her. Miss Nina, I said urgently, I have something to tell you. You are in great danger. You must come with me and talk to that man in the hand carriage. Your life depends on it. Miss Nina was very shocked by my words. I walked with her to the hand carriage before she had time to object. I did not stay there with her for more than two minutes. Within five minutes, I saw her walking up the beach with a grey-haired man. He had a slight limp. I knew that she was safe with that man. I went back to the rock and sat down. Mr. Slinkton came back soon afterwards. He was surprised that his niece had gone. We talked for a few minutes. He told me that Miss Nina was very ill, and he looked sad while he told me. I replied politely to everything he said, but I was holding a weapon in my pocket as we walked along together. Mr. Sampson, may I ask you something? He suddenly inquired. What is the news of that poor man Meltham? Is he dead yet? No, I told him. He's not dead yet. But he won't live long, I'm afraid. What a sad place the world is, Mr. Slinkton sighed quietly. Part 3 it was November before I saw Mr. Slinkton again, this time in London. I had a very important appointment at Middle Temple. I arrived at the temple and went up some stairs. There were two doors at the top of the stairs. The name Beckwith was painted on one door. The name Slinkton was painted on the other. I went in the door marked Beckwith. The room was dirty, and there were empty bottles everywhere. A young man got up when I entered. He walked very unsteadily, and he seemed drunk. Slinkton's not in yet, he said loudly. I'll call him. He went into the corridor and began to shout loudly. Hey, Julius, come in here and have a drink, he called. 
Mr. Slinkton came into the room. He was very surprised to see me. Julius, this is Mr. Sampson, Beckwith introduced us. Boil the brandy, Julius, he said. He gave Mr. Slinkton a filthy saucepan. Come on, boil the brandy the way you usually do. Mr. Slinkton was embarrassed at my presence in the room. I could see. How is your niece, Mr. Slinkton? I asked him quietly. I am sorry to say my niece has left me, he replied. She went away without a word of explanation. Beckwith held out the saucepan once more. Boil the brandy, Julius, he repeated. Give me what you always give me for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Boil the brandy, I tell you. Now Mr. Slinkton looked even more embarrassed. This was not a pleasant situation for him. He thought for a moment, and then he spoke to me. You're a man of the world, Mr. Sampson, he began. I'll tell you the truth. No, Mr. Slinkton, I said firmly. You'll never tell the truth. I know all about you. You want to save your insurance company some money, he said calmly. You will try to argue that I was responsible for Beckwith's condition and for his eventual death. But you won't be able to prove that, you know. You won't be able to prove anything. Beckwith suddenly picked up his brandy glass and threw it at Mr. Slinkton. The glass cut his forehead and blood began to flow down his face. Mr. Slinkton took out his handkerchief and dried his face. As he was doing this, another man came into the room, a man with grey hair who walked with a slight limp. Mr. Slinkton looked at this man in surprise. Look very carefully at me, Beckwith cried out. You're a rogue, Slinkton, and I've caught you. I took these rooms on purpose just to catch you. I pretended to be a drunkard in order to catch you, and I've done it. You'll never escape now. You see, the last time you went to see Mr. Sampson, I had already been to see him myself. I went to his house very early that morning. We know everything. We know what you were planning. You thought you could kill me for the two thousand pounds of the insurance policy, didn't you? You wanted to kill me with brandy, didn't you? But you wanted me to die quickly. That's why you also gave me small amounts of poison. Mr. Slinkton was surprised by Beckwith's behaviour. The young man did not seem at all drunk now. At first, Mr. Slinkton did not know how to react. Then he found his courage. He was very pale, but he looked coldly at Beckwith. He did not say a word. 
I took these rooms on purpose, Beckwith went on. I knew what kind of man you are, you see. You're the man who's already killed one innocent girl for her money. And now you're slowly killing another one. Slinkton laughed. <laughs> Think how stupid you really are. Beckwith continued. You thought I was drinking brandy all day, but I threw most of it away. You never knew that I came into your room at night when you were asleep. I took all your papers, Slinkton. I read your journal, too. It's got all the information. About the poisons that you use. It explains everything. I know where the journal is now. Slinkton looked at Beckwith questioningly. It's not in your desk, Beckwith told him. Then you're a thief, Slinkton told him calmly. He spoke calmly. But his face was white. I'm your niece's shadow, Beckwith said quietly. Suddenly, Slinkton lost his calm and his courage. He looked frightened now. Still, he said nothing. I've watched you all the time, Beckwith said. I knew. That you were poisoning Miss Nina. I went to Mr. Sampson and told him everything. That man standing at the door is Mr. Sampson's servant. The three of us have saved your niece's life. Beckwith paused for a moment to look at Slinkton. Then he went on. You don't even know my real name," he said very quietly. "You asked Mr. Sampson several times if he had any news about Meltham. I can give you news about him. I am Meltham," he announced triumphantly. "I loved your niece, Margaret. I could not save her." But I promised to pursue you to the end, and I've done it! He cried. I've hunted you down, Slinkton. Slinkton now looked in horror at the man who was accusing him. He was unable to speak for fear. You never knew my real name, Meltham told him. You. Are seeing me under my real name now for the first time. You will see me again when you answer the charge of murder in court. And I hope you see me in your imagination when they put the rope around your neck and the crowd cries out for your death. Slinkton turned quickly away from us for a second, and put his hand to his mouth. The room suddenly filled with the smell of some chemical. Slinkton gasped, <gasps> ran a few steps, and fell to the floor. He was dead. Meltham and I made sure that Slinkton was dead. Then we left the room together. I have done what I promised to do, Meltham said sadly to me. My life is ended now. I did everything that I could to help him, but the poor man died a few months later. The stir outside the Cafe Royal. By Clarence Rook. 
He was a brilliant criminal, and he used many different names. The man who robbed the bank in Detroit, and shot the bank manager, was known as Captain Matherin. The man who committed fraud in Melbourne, was known as Rossiter. The police believed that Matherin and Rossiter were the same man. The police could not catch Matherin. He was very careful to protect his real identity. Most of the people who worked with him did not even know what he looked like. Only two people in the world could identify him. One of them was the bank manager he had killed in Detroit. Matherin shot him in front of his girlfriend. It was the other person who ended Matherin's criminal career. It all happened in a very dull way, if you look at it from one point of view. But the story is very different, if you look at it from another point of view. I first heard the story from a young detective that I met in a pub near Westminster. Then a young woman called Miss Van Snoop gave me more information. A young lady was driving down Regent Street one day in a horse-drawn cab. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon and it was warm and sunny. The cab was travelling slowly because the young lady said she was frightened of horses. Regent Street was full of women doing their shopping and men standing around talking. The young lady looked at the street with interest. There was a little stir as the young lady's cab approached the Café Royal. One cab was stopping outside the restaurant and there were two others behind it. The traffic in the street stopped for a moment. The girl looked at the people who were standing on the steps of the building. She sat back quickly in her seat. Drop me here, she told the driver. Her accent was American. The driver stopped the cab and the girl got out. She gave the driver a coin. The driver looked at it with interest. He smiled. Americans are very generous, he said to himself. The girl walked towards the Café Royal. She glanced at the men who were standing on the steps. Several of the men looked at her with interest. They were surprised to see a woman on her own. She entered the restaurant and walked into the dining room. American, you can be sure of that one of the men commented. They go anywhere they want. They're not afraid of anything. There was a tall man walking in front of the girl towards the dining room. He was very well dressed. He stopped for a moment when he entered the dining room. He was looking for a table. The girl stopped behind him. The waiter waved the man to a table. The girl 
sat down at a table behind him. Excuse me, madam, the waiter said to her. This table is for four people. Would you mind? I guess I'll stay where I am, the girl said softly. She gave the waiter a determined look and put some money into his hand. The restaurant was full of people. Many people looked at the girl who was eating alone. But she did not seem to be embarrassed or shy. She did not look at anyone. When she was not looking at her plate, she kept her eyes fixed on the back of the man at the next table. He ordered champagne with his lunch. The girl drank water. Suddenly, she called a waiter. Please bring me a sheet of paper and my bill, she said quietly. The waiter came back with a sheet of paper. The girl thought for a few minutes. Then she began to write something. She folded the paper. And put it in her purse. Then she paid her bill. A few minutes later, the man at the next table paid his bill as well. The girl put on her gloves and watched the man's back. The man got up to leave the dining room. He walked past the girl's table. She turned her face away and looked at a mirror on the wall. Then she too got up. She followed the man out of the dining room. The man stopped on the steps for a moment. The porter was talking to a policeman. He noticed the man, and asked him if he wanted a cab. Yes, please, the man replied. Then the porter noticed the girl. She was standing behind the man. As he turned towards her, he saw that her hand was in the man's pocket. She was stealing something. She pulled her hand back quickly. What? The man cried out. He turned round to face the girl. Is something missing, sir? The porter asked him. My cigarette case, the man said. It's gone. What's this? Said the policeman. He stepped forward. The porter. Pointed at the girl. That woman has stolen this gentleman's cigarette case, he said. I saw her doing it. The man looked at the girl. Just give it back, he said quietly. I don't want to make a fuss about it. I haven't got it, the girl answered. I'm not a thief. I never touched your pocket. I saw her do it, the porter said again. Right, said the policeman suddenly. You'll have to come with me, young lady. You too, sir, he said to the well-dressed man. We'll take a cab to the police station. I didn't steal anything, the girl said again. She got into the cab very calmly when it arrived. The policeman watched her carefully. He did not want her to throw anything out of the window. The well-dressed man sat quietly in the cab, looking out of the window. When they arrived at the police station, the girl denied the crime again. 
We'll have to search her, the inspector decided. She was taken to a room for an interview with the female searcher. The girl entered the room of the female searcher. As soon as the door was closed, she put her hand in her pocket. She took out the cigarette case and placed it on the table. There you are, the girl said. Now, she went on, I want you to look in this pocket. Find my purse and take it out. The woman took out the girl's purse. Open it, the girl ordered. There's a note inside, she said. Read it, please. The woman took out the note the girl had written in the restaurant. It said, I am going to steal something from this man. It is the only way to get him into a police station without violence. He is Colonel Matherin, alias Rossiter, alias Connell. The police in Detroit, New York, Melbourne, Colombo and London want him. He is a very dangerous man. I am a New York detective, Nora Van Snoop. Take that note to your boss, Miss Van Snoop told the woman. Do it now. The woman left the room and spoke to someone in the corridor. A few minutes later, the inspector came into the room. Don't worry, Miss Van Snoop told him. I've got my documents here with me. I can prove who I am. Are you sure that this is the man who shot the Detroit bank manager? The inspector asked her. Heavens! Miss Van Snoop cried. Didn't I see him shoot Will Stevens with my own eyes? Didn't I join the police to find him? The inspector left the room. The girl listened attentively. Then she heard a shout from the next room. What? The inspector came back. I think you're right, he told her. It is Mathurin. But why didn't you ask the police to help you? I wanted to arrest him myself. Miss Van Snoop explained. And now I have, she said quietly. Oh, Will, Will. Miss Van Snoop sat down and began to cry. <laughs> Thirty minutes later, she left the police station and went into a post office. She telegrammed her resignation from the New York Police Force.